morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the AFR EMS Case Studies. My name is Chris Ortiz. I'm the EMS Chief for Albuquerque Fire Rescue. And today I'm joined by Dr. Kim Pruitt, our Medical Director. Hi, Chief. Welcome, Doc. And Lieutenant Jonathan Dean. Hello, Chief. Thanks for joining us to talk about an awesome case that you had with uh, kind of twofold. We had an anaphylaxis patient and a STEMI that you were treating at the same time. So really an interesting case. Um, Obviously assigned to Rescue 7, so Rescue 7 and Engine 7, you all were dispatched to a 2 Delta, and it was for a 67-year-old female who was having an allergic reaction. So just talk us through, as you're en route to this call, um, what's going through your mind, what you're thinking in terms of treatment for something like this? Uh, well, the first, first thing we're thinking about is airway and airway compromise, um, making sure that um, you know oxygen, airway was open and she had a good oxygen saturation. We want to know how far along the anaphylaxis had progressed with her um, see, making sure it wasn't like a multi-system type of uh, issue. All right, you got there and then you, you arrived at a house, said the scene was safe, and then on arrival, um, you made contact with the patient sitting in the chair. Talk through what you saw or how the patient was presenting. So initially, this is actually out of district for us. Um, we went with engine 17. So engine 17 had already arrived on scene first. It was closer to their station. And um, when we arrived on scene, they had already had the patient on oxygen. According to uh, Lieutenant McCoy, who filled me in, the um, patient was unresponsive, sitting in her chair, um, kind of with agonal respirations and just unresponsive. And when I walked in, uh, they had already put her on a non-rebreather. I was starting to treat her hypoxia. She was sitting at a room air of 83% with respirations about six. Um, and so she was, again, unresponsive. Uh, skin was red, uh, warm, and flushed, and um, just completely unresponsive. So we started treatment from there. Okay. So you have an unresponsive patient. Obviously, it could be a whole range of things. Mm -hmm. um, did the family give any history since the patient was unresponsive? So her daughter was there, um, and it said that the patient did have a shellfish allergy and that they were having some dinner and that there was fish and other possibly shellfish involved at the dinner, and that about a half an hour before, the patient started to feel kind of a little funny, like she was beginning to have an allergic reaction to dinner. And then uh, she had taken some Benadryl and kind of thought that was going to be the end of it. And then she completely just went unresponsive. So her daughter ended up calling 911 and prior to uh, our arrival, ended up giving her her own EpiPen. Oh, wow. Okay. So the patient's family administered the EpiPen and obviously no results from that. The patient was still unconscious when you all arrived on scene. Correct. Okay. Very interesting. So talk us through as far as your initial assessment or your first interventions that you're thinking through when you know that this is possibly an allergic reaction to something. Obviously, it's pretty serious because she has that EpiPen available to her. What's your thought processes in treatment? Uh, so the thought process of treatment where as far as making sure that obviously if respiration is down, I'm worried about airway compromise. So we started uh, quickly working on lung sounds. They were diminished in lowers with wheezing. Um, so we started giving her uh, a duoneb. And uh, again, I had multiple people there. So my partner was working on IV. So that way we could establish that to give other drugs, uh, such as more uh, Benadryl or uh, dexamethasone as well. And we actually ended up giving both of those as well um, with that. After she would received that treatment, uh, she was still unresponsive, but the wheezing started to get better. Um, her oxygen saturations went up. We did put her on capnography, and she was showing some uh, shark fin waveform as well. Oh, wow. Still unresponsive at that point. Mm -hmm. So all the treatments were lining up. So we got an IV started. Uh, we gave the Benadryl, the Dex, um, and obviously we were do, handling the airway mm -hmm. and the Duoneb, so doing the best we can for her in that moment. So it sounds like a great job. Talk to us real quick, Doc, if you can, about anaphylaxis and how that differentiates for us as providers in terms of what's an allergic reaction and what's an anaphylactic reaction. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, and sometimes it can be hard because our treatment, the epinephrine, is a pretty potent drug. And so I typically tend to watch for two systems involved. Um, if I can convince myself that there's two systems, then, then it, at that point it's time for epinephrine. So airway for sure. Um, any trouble breathing, cardiovascular collapse, altered mental status, uh, urticaria or a rash, and a frequently missed uh, system that we look at, and this is more common in kids, but 
GI involvement, so vomiting uh, or diarrhea, if I can convince myself that there's two systems involved, then I'll go ahead and give the epi. And it sounds like she had a convincing enough story with the family that thankfully probably our dispatchers had prompted them to go ahead and give that um, that treatment right out of the gate. So um, that was that was the correct thing to do here. Yeah, they did a great job. So we're improving. The airway was improving, obviously, with the, the care that you were providing. Um, the family had already administered the epi, which we talked about, and we know that it is a strong drug. It's a potent drug in the vasoconstriction of those small vessels. Did you ha did it go through your head to try to administer more epi, or what held you back from wanting to do that? I remembered uh, earlier training that we had talked about epi and being a little bit more caref careful with elderly patients. Um, given that second dose. So being the fact that she was still unresponsive, um, she was tachycardic already, um, I just wanted to double check, get a 12 lead on her to make sure everything was okay. Um, we ended up doing a 12 lead and results of the 12 lead being that it was showing uh, ST elevation. So that prompted me to stop that thinking of going down to second dose of epi. Um, and then actually right after we got the the 12 lead, we started to have GI involvement where she was unresponsive, but then she started to vomit as well. So then we were worried about, again, airway compromise on a oncologist patient. So um, we just ended up just beginning transport at that point and uh, controlling her airway, making sure that uh, she didn't uh, aspirate anything. Great job. And Obviously, the EKGs evolve. We know that. Um, and she was showing the STEMI probably because she was hypoxic and she was hypertensive because of that first epi administration. And no fault of anybody, right? That's the life threat was the epi or the, the airway compromise. So they had to treat it with epi. That's absolutely right. And this is this is an excellent case. And you're, I love your clinical decision making here um, because it's really tough. The anaphylaxis is absolutely a life threat. And the treat for that life-threatening process is epinephrine. The problem is epinephrine is a very powerful drug. And I think sometimes we get pretty comfortable with using it because we do handle a lot of emergencies. Um, but it's not uncommon. There's fairly substantial amount of case studies where it can either just a simple IM injection of the small 0.3 dose can cause a STEMI or cause a stroke. And it's, it's because it's very uh, potent vasoconstrictor like you mentioned for those small vessels and I think in this setting it was what it was neat to watch this case evolve because she was hypoxic and she was hypertensive probably probably the hypertensiveness as a result of the epi um, but as you started to fix her vital signs and as that epi started to wear off did did you see the EKG change I did the EKG uh, started to come back to normal and then she started to uh, regain consciousness. And then by the time we got to the hospital, um, she was still showing a little bit of slight elevation, but nowhere near STEMI criteria. It had started to come back to normal. And she had no chest pain uh, whatsoever. She just kind of stated that she felt funny. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty fascinating case and it's an excellent demonstration of just how strong epinephrine can be. Um, when it's administered, even in the correct setting. Um, and we saw in this case here that it obviously led to a STEMI, the hypoxia, the hypertension that came from the epi. Have you seen in your, in your experiences where we see any other arrhythmias that come secondary to the epi administration, or is this an abnormal case? Um, no, it can happen. I don't think it happens very frequently. That's why we wanted to have this discussion. But um, probably the patient population that we administer the most epi to is our severe respiratory distress patients. And um, that is always, I always think of epi as the nuclear option there. If, if someone has bad COPD and we've, we've tried the Duoneb and the CPAP and the MAG and the DEX and everything else, um, I like to think of epi as the medication you give right before they're about to code. So if you truly think they're about to go under respiratory distress, epi is the right medication to use, the IM epi, the 0 0.3 dose, but always remembering that these patients, they tend to be older, so older one, older folks with more medical comorbidities, so like underlying hypertension, uh, cardiovascular disease, smokers, people we know are higher risk, um, are higher risk, and giving that epi can cause, it's a pro-arrhythmic, um, it can cause STEMIs and strokes, and so this is a 
excellent reminder of that in a little bit different setting with anaphylaxis because we wouldn't hold it back here. They did the right thing by giving it, but just to monitor afterwards for those side effects. And you, we always talk about it, vital signs are vital, and then having a good patient assessment, um, knowing with those respiratory patients specifically, not anaphylaxis, but respiratory patients, of knowing that it's still okay to give epi if they've hit that point, but just kind of being cautious and like a, like you said, a nuclear option, last last. Last ditch effort, effort yeah. yeah. So that's a fantastic job. So you mentioned it, you uh, did the transport, and patient came back kind of talking with you by the time you arrived at the hospital, more stable? Yes, more stable. Vital starting started to come back down. Her pressure uh, lowered. Uh, her tachycardia came down to more towards an appropriate level is what I felt more comfortable with her. And she was able to uh, maintain a sat in the 90s just with, uh, you know, two liters of oxygen. So we were able to take her off high flow. That's awesome. So kind of off topic a little bit, but I know in a busy system and at a busy station like you're, you're at currently, you encounter a lot of patients with altered mental status, right? Mm -hmm. And I kind of wanted to just talk through with your experiences because you've done this a long time, both with Albuquerque Fire and I know you work with Albuquerque Ambulance as well. So you've seen a lot of patients um, encountering altered mental status. What are the things that you look for to try to rule in and rule out um, what might be going on with somebody with an altered mentation? Uh, First thing, obviously, is I think uh, a BGL. Um, make sure that it's not a, a, uh, a sugar issue. Um, then we'll again go to uh, their uh, oxygen saturation, make sure they're not hypoxic, and then secondary is check for, or third, check for, uh, you know, start checking pupils, look for any type of uh, narcotic, narcotic use or abuse. Perfect. And Doc, from, from your perspective on the hospital side, is there anything different that you guys do other than what we do in the field? No, it's the exact same approach. We uh, all share kind of the same patient population. And so I love your your thoughts about vital signs first, right? Like what are the numbers and which ones can I fix, right? Can I fix the hypoxia? Yes. Can I fix the sugar? Yes. How about the blood pressure? Starting with vital signs and then, and then thinking about tox or metabolics, so checking the pupils, um, thinking about some sort of ingestion, any sort of ingestion can cause altered mental status. And then moving on to ischemia or infarction, you know, doing, digging a little deeper into that assessment, physical exam, maybe after you've secured the vital signs, um, trying to find out what's going on. Sometimes we just don't know. Um, but I think that stepwise approach with, with vital signs, tox, metabolic, ischemia, infarction, um, is a good, is a good way to approach it. And Lieutenant Dean and his team did a fantastic job on this call, um, identified the life threat, treated it, and then took the other steps in their assessment with the end tidal CO2, the 12 lead EKG, to just get a full picture of what be, would be going on with this patient. That's how they captured the second part, right, of this per potential STEMI. Yeah, I, I love the way that you approach this patient. It was very methodical, very thoughtful, um, and... Also, I always love to say just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? And you had enough clinical evidence that I think probably 50-50, maybe another provider would have given more epi. Mm -hmm. but, but you felt comfortable enough with what you had and with the treatments and the direction that your treatments were going to hold off until you got your 12 lead and until you got a little more information. And I honestly think that probably really helped her outcome because if you had given more epi it might have made that problem worse and uh I, I appreciate your your thoughtful approach to this patient you did an excellent job here thank you and an odd so, question just from the hospital's perspective like we see we treated everything and then we saw this and then we see that it's potentially a STEMI we're you know asking folks to call that STEMI alert early we make that call but then we see that the treatment that we provided helped do we stand that down or just let them know once we get there? Do we leave it going? This 12 lead uh, is absolutely a STEMI. And so once you see a STEMI, it was STEMI criteria, I would keep it going, um, even if it does get better as, as your transport and your treatment start to take effect. Um, it's important to keep that 12 lead and show that to the hospital um, because there was, there was definitely something going on there, even if the one that maybe they get looks better. That's because you fixed a whole lot, right? right. <laughs> um, but keep... I would, I would continue once you pull the trigger on that STEMI alert, it needs to stay. Right. Biggest reason that we do this, and we talked about that before we started recording, was that this is for everybody in the field who may have seen this call or hasn't seen this call yet and getting them the training. What takeaways will you give to the folks that are watching as far as what you learn from this, what you'll do next time, or what you would do differently even? 
Um, I think the biggest thing I learned is uh, how potent epi can be. Um, you know, think about the amounts that we give in a cardiac arrest that are in far higher numbers. And, and thinking about it, this is such a small amount. And to see this kind of reaction, like it improved her airway, but to see the cardiac result of it was a real learning experience for me. Um, so I'd still do all the treatment again. You know, this was, I think it was a great team effort. It was everybody in the truck working together. Um, you know, my partner and I discussing options, you know, that talking back and forth, making sure of, should we give the second dose? Do we hold back? You know, um, and I, I think I probably would have kept everything the same as uh, we did. It, it ended up being a good outcome. Just, you know, probably transported a little bit earlier instead of <laughs> finding out we didn't have a transport unit as early as I would have liked. And on the flip side of that argument, too, is definitively you did <clears throat> all the care that that patient needed. So everything that you needed to do was done on scene. So, yeah, making that decision once everything kind of stabilizes is a good call. But I think ultimately you had the tools in your toolbox to be able to treat her effectively, and that's what you guys did. So even if you maybe held back on the transport just a little bit longer than you normally would have, you did everything that treated this patient in the right way. So you did a great job. Thank you. So I appreciate it. And I appreciate you coming out to talk to us about this case. Uh, if anybody else has any interesting cases that they want to bring forth, either record or uh, have us record on your behalf, uh, go to our SharePoint page. You can make a submission there or just reach out to your 7-8. And until then, we'll see you next time. Thanks.